Hello and welcome to Wall Street Vision. On this show, we explore the thinking of the best investors and we examine lessons from the stock market. I'm your host, Vlad Dolgochev. This show is for informational purposes only and is not investment advice. Check out the show notes for the full disclaimer. Hello, everybody. Hello, Vision Nation. What is happening? In this week's episode, we'll cover the story of how David Einhorn shorted Allied Capital stock. Short selling has been in the news a lot lately. The David Einhorn story is really interesting. David wrote a book about the whole thing called Fooling Some of the People All of the Time, and I just finished reading it. For a finance book, it was quite a page turner. In this episode, we'll discuss the Allied Capital story, We'll go into why analyzing incentives can help you figure out any sort of situation. It's like a secret cheat code to understanding investing and life. We'll also discuss why betting against a stock is a hard way to make money, and we'll cover what happens when conflicts in investing turn personal. Juicy stuff. Before I get into the story, here's a quick David Einhorn bio. He's a hedge fund manager in New York. His hedge fund is called Greenlight Capital. They have long and short positions, which means that they make bets on companies doing well, and they also make bets against companies. A long position is when you buy a stock and hope it goes up in price. A short position is when you make money when the stock goes down in price. So the story takes place starting in the early 2000s. It started with David giving the speech at a charity event where he was supposed to pitch his best stock idea. And what he ended up doing was he pitched shorting Allied Capital stock. He felt that their stock was overvalued, so he bet against it. Being a short seller is quite a ballsy thing to do. Short sellers are going against historical performance, and essentially they're going against optimism. Short sellers are like the party poopers that are trying to keep the party from getting out of control. They have an important role, but they catch a lot of flack for it, and they're not the most popular kids at the party. If you look at the returns of the stock market over the past 100 years, you'll see that markets overall have had great long-term returns. And being a short seller is going against this whole trend. So David gave the speech. It's on YouTube, by the way. It's funny watching it. David is so young in the video, but already you can tell that he really knows his stuff when it comes to investing. After the speech, news got around pretty quickly, and it caused Allied Capital stock to plummet. What happened next was this crazy five-year battle between David Einhorn and Allied Capital. David's argument against Allied was that their accounting was aggressive and somewhat misleading. The cliff notes of David's argument is that Allied kept investments on their books at a higher value than they should have. He was saying that Allied didn't mark down their investments. So what does this mean? Well, here's a really simple example of what a markdown is. Let's say I own an investment company and I invest 100000 into company XYZ stock. A year later, my investment in XYZ is only worth $50,000 because company XYZ did not do too well. If I choose to keep the investment on my books at $100,000, it's not really painting the whole picture. Now, there's lots of complicated accounting and legal stuff to describe lots of different situations around this concept, but at the core of it, David's argument to me would be that I should write down the investment to $50,000 and take a $50,000 loss. That makes sense, right? If the market now perceives my investment as being only worth $50,000, it makes sense that I should also report it as a $50,000 value investment on my books. Well, David found a few cases where Allied Capital didn't do that sort of markdown. He also pointed out that there was shady stuff going on in one of the companies that Allied Capital owned, a company called Business Loan Express, or BLX. BLX was a big percent of the overall Allied portfolio, so if something shady was happening there, it was a big deal. Before I get into that, let's go over what BLX did as their business model. 
They were a business development company, which meant that they essentially provided loans to small-sized businesses. These loans were usually in the million-dollar range, but some were higher and some were lower, of course. The government ran this program where the government itself would guarantee a certain percent of the loans. Here's how it would work. Essentially, if I owned a gas station and I wanted to buy another gas station, I could go to BLX and get a loan. If I went bankrupt, the government would pay a certain percent of the loan to BLX. What a great deal for BLX! Even if they screwed up by giving loans to people that shouldn't have been getting them, they still wouldn't lose the full value of the loan. The government would come in and cover a large part of it. That's a super simple way that business development loans worked. The reason behind this sort of system was that the government wanted to help small businesses get loans. So the government worked with companies like BLX to make this happen. It's all good in theory, but you can see how this sort of thing could lead to some bad behavior. And we'll cover some of that toward the end of this episode. Back to the story. David gave lots of examples of legal things Allied Capital did to maintain their market value. But he also described cases of alleged fraud that BLX was committing. David alleged that they were falsifying business appraisals and giving loans to crappy businesses and doing all sorts of stuff like that. Of course, the people at Allied Capital were super pissed about David's presentation, and they went ballistic. It was an epic back and forth between David and Allied, and at times it was in the public eye. The story went through some crazy twists and turns where David had to deal with a PR campaign aimed at making him look bad. He had to deal with an inquiry by the SEC into his hedge fund, which did not find that David did anything wrong, by the way. And David even found that some of his phone records were stolen by someone. The worst thing was that David's wife ended up getting fired from her editing role at a big financial newspaper as the conflict between David and Allied got more public. I'm sure that was a really rough situation in the Einhorn household. I don't know about you guys, but if I got my girlfriend fired for something that I did at my job, I'd be sleeping on the couch for a long time. And how crazy is it that someone steals your phone records just to mess with you when all you're doing is going about your business doing your job? Can you imagine going to your office job and crunching numbers on a spreadsheet and then you find out someone is stealing your phone records and your wife gets fired from her dream job that she's had for years because of some presentation you gave at a charity event? Ouch! So David submitted a bunch of evidence to various government agencies telling them that Allied Capital and BLX had some financial shenanigans happening. But he was faced with a lot of roadblocks, and as he describes in the book, it might have to do with people related to Allied Capital making lots of contributions to politicians. These contributions were being made at the same agencies that dealt with overseeing these business development loans. The way the story is written, you get a sense that some of the government agencies didn't want to dig deep to investigate Allied Capital or BLX. There could be any number of reasons for that. Maybe they were just understaffed and didn't have enough people to get to the bottom of the situation. It is interesting that those political donations from the companies went to members in the government who could have intervened and investigated some of this alleged fraud. But they chose not to do too much about it. You've got to remember that the whole story is being told from David's perspective, so there may be a bias here. Also, financially, it was a pretty complicated situation, so I could see why it was a hard task that would take a long time to figure out if you were trying to prosecute someone. Reading the story, there's many layers to it, and it's not a straightforward black and white situation where it's clear that Ally did the wrong thing. There's nuances to the story. So for someone to see David's point of view, it would take a while for them to understand the whole situation. They'd probably need a finance or accounting background. I have a finance background, and I found some of the accounting stuff in the story to be pretty confusing. There was so much publicity on this battle between Allied and David that I'm sure David Einhorn put only factual information into the book. I think that if he lied about anything, he'd probably get sued. So I bet he had a team of lawyers read and reread the full book to make sure it was accurate. And by the way, how funny would that be? Calling up a corporate lawyer going, Yeah, so I need you to read my book to make sure I don't get sued. 
wait a minute, that's going to cost me how much? 500 bucks an hour just to be my editor? David has deep pockets, so I'm sure he didn't mind too much. The story in the book ended in 2008, with Allied still doing okay as a company, despite David showing a whole bunch of reasons for five years that investors should not buy into their stock. That's where the story in the book ended. But since then, Allied ran into various types of trouble, and eventually its stock got crushed and it was sold to a competitor. By the way, I'm pretty sure that David Einhorn pledged any money that he made from the book and any money that he made from shorting Allied stock that he was going to give it up to charity. And I think the reason he did that was to show that he wasn't really motivated by money, but he just wanted the truth to come out. So you can say that David was right in choosing to short their stock, but he was really early. And as we know in investing, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between being early and being wrong. There's a lot of takeaways in this story, but before I dive into them, I'll quickly mention that if you're enjoying the podcast, please give us a rating and smash the subscribe button. And if you know someone who would find this content valuable, please share this episode with them. My goal for the podcast is to help people learn the lessons from the best investors and to help people understand the stock market better. I think that's important today as there's lots of information out there that can lead people on the wrong path. And I would love for more people to benefit from this type of content. All right, let's get into some takeaways. In the story, David describes what was happening at BLX and how incentives played a role there. This reminds me of Charlie Munger's lessons that we covered in episode 5 of this podcast. I've only recently started to really take note of incentives, and it's mind-blowing how important they are. Incentives are so key to figure out how a situation will play out. It's like a secret cheat code to figuring out any situation in investing and in life, really. Understanding incentives gives you a simple way to predict what's going to happen, because most people act in a way that will benefit them the most, especially when looking at things in a business context. So let's take a quick look at the incentives in the BLX story and why they led to some shady stuff happening. The BLX management incentive is to have lots of loans made. That's what their compensation is probably based on. Entrepreneurs getting loans are happy. They get money to grow their businesses. There's a government agency that guarantees a certain percent of the loans that go bust. The government agency doing these guarantees looks important if it guarantees lots of loans. So they want to keep approving loans because that looks good in the public eye. They can say that their loans helped create thousands of jobs. Always a good political platform. Now, at the same time, the government agency is understaffed, so they can't do proper investigations, and in some cases, they don't have the processes to properly punish bad lenders. The key thing is that BLX was getting money from the government for each loan that went bad. This meant that BLX could take on a lot more risk. BLX management wanted to take on more risk and make more loans because their bonuses were based on the number of loans that they made. The government didn't have a clear-cut way of punishing BLX for providing too many bad loans. So this whole thing created a cycle where BLX would make crappy loans, and when they went bad, the government would pay BLX, and no one was getting in trouble for any of this happening. This is why if you're looking at an investment, or even in any type of situation really, thinking of the incentives can help you cut through to the bottom of how a situation will play out. Generally speaking, people will act based on the way they're incentivized. If they're incentivized to make bad loans, they'll probably do it. Another layer to incentives, and this is something that Buffett has talked about before, is if the company is a small part of the portfolio for a portfolio manager, it's not the end of the world for the portfolio manager if the investment does not play out. But for the management of the company, it's life or death. They're in a situation where they're fighting for their life. They're fighting with their backs against the wall. That's why a company's management will fight dirty if they have to. It's life or death for them. It's their whole livelihood that depends on that battle. But for the portfolio manager, the whole investment might only be 5% of their assets that they're currently managing. So if the investment doesn't do well, it's bad, but it's not life or death. That's the other reason why short sellers have such a hard time making money. 
Reading up on this story, I was really impressed with the crazy depth of research that David Einhorn went through. I've watched a bunch of interviews with him, and he's a true expert. It's hard for an average investor to replicate that sort of effort. David went super deep on his research, trying to piece together information from all sorts of places to get a handle on how Allied was doing as a company. I imagine that this was a special case because the story got so personal. It seems that way anyway. I'm sure he wasn't putting this much effort into every investment that he has, but the level of digging he went through was super remarkable. That's a great note for anyone who is an investor themselves. Seeing this level of detail and research gives you an idea of what it takes to perform as well as Greenlight Capital has performed throughout the years. At one point in the book, David presented his information about a bunch of shady loans to a government agency. And he realized that he had more information and research on those loans than the agency that was actually guaranteeing the loans. Ay ay ay, holy cannoli! That reminds me of Mike Berry when he took out specific subprime mortgage tranches and bet against them. Mike Berry knew more about those mortgage tranches than the bank that was on the other side of his bet. Based on David Einhorn and Mike Berry, it really seems like one of the ingredients of the secret sauce to being an amazing investor is having a ridiculous obsession about the investment that you're pursuing. It's not enough just to be interested in the topic. These guys are obsessed. These guys both have tunnel vision and leave no stone unturned in their research. And that's definitely one way to improve your odds of success. I also want to mention that short selling is super hard to do. It can take years for it to pay off. During the five years or so that the story took place, Allied stock did fairly well. Since David Einhorn was short selling the stock, he would have lost money on this investment. David's hedge fund still did well overall during that whole Allied Capital saga because their other investment paid off. But it's amazing how a company that has funky financials can keep trucking along for so long. That's really eye-opening for people that want to try short selling or buying puts on a stock. Even if the stock might not be doing well or it has questionable financials, it can keep that going for a long time. Short sellers are generally viewed pretty negatively as well, so on top of doing a very difficult investment, they also have to deal with hate from the public. Especially today, where the hedge funds that were short selling some of the meme stocks, for example, are getting a public lashing big time. My last takeaway is that when things get personal in business, some people go thermonuclear. During the story, David's wife was fired from her job. She wasn't involved in the investment side of things at all. She was purely collateral damage. Then someone also stole David's phone records. And on top of it all, there was this whole back and forth in the public between Allied and David. Investing is hard enough as it is. When there's the personal element that gets involved, it's hard to remain objective. I think in investing, it's important to keep things impersonal and logic-based. When you get emotionally invested into a situation, it's hard to make the best decisions. And I get the sense that this story would have not turned out into such a big deal if it wasn't for all of this bad blood between David and Allied. All right, Vision Nation, that wraps it up for this week's episode. If you've enjoyed it, please hit the subscribe button, leave a review, and if you know someone who's interested in investing, please share this episode with them. Thank you, and I hope you have a great day. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. I may maintain positions in the securities discussed on this podcast.